Paul's making it seem the commandments are grievous and not possible because we've all sinned. Well, yeah, we've all sinned, but we need to repent. And then we can be back under the blessing found in Deuteronomy 28 of keeping God's law. And the main blessing of keeping the commandments, as Jesus said in John 14, is having the Father and Son make their abode in you and having their perfect love that casts out fear and peace that passes all understanding and the, the perfect joy of the Father, which is your strength. You get all the fruit of the Spirit. You can be led of the Holy Spirit, but you can't get there without keeping the commandments and he's poo-pooing them. Here he goes on again on boasting. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So if you don't... He's saying you don't need to work the works of the law anymore because it's your faith in Jesus that, that trumps all that. And it's not true. It's your faith in Jesus that will cause you to want to keep God's commandments and do right by him. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay, let's read Paul again. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Let's go back to good old James, to what old James said. This is his battle against Paul. He says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. A man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. But wilt thou know of a man that faith without works is dead? And here we have Paul saying the exact opposite. Which is it, guys? You cannot do some kind of verbal gymnastics to try to tell me they're not saying the opposite thing right here. You just can't. You can't gaslight me anymore. You can't do that. I'm going to default to the red ink. I'm going to default to the fact that James, what he said, coincides with what John the Apostle said and what Jesus said in Matthew, John, and, and Revelation. These contradictions are very clear when you start to map them out. In fact, just real quickly... I started this list and it's by, by far not exhaustive, but just let me show you right here. I started making a spreadsheet of all the contradictions between Paul and Jesus. Jesus says, don't eat things sacrificed to idols. Paul says you can't if your faith strong enough. James says you're justified by faith, by, uh, by your works, which show your faith. Paul says you're justified by faith only. Uh, Jesus says not one dot jot or tittle will be done away until all is fulfilled. Um, Paul says in Galatians 3, if you keep the law with regard to circumcision, you're under a curse. And look how long this list is. And that's by far, far not exhaustive. I'm telling you, need to do your homework. If anybody wants that list, just uh, write me and I'll be happy to copy paste it in an email and send it back to you. So here we, again, we have Paul. He goes, where's boasting that is excluded by what law of works? Nay, by the law of faith only. Okay, so then he goes on. This is the confusion of Paul. And this is where he is gaslighting you so hard. He's playing us like a fiddle when he goes here in verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. So now what the Paulinites will say is he's saying, oh, you'll have the Holy Spirit. So you'll keep the law by default, but don't study it or do it or don't get circumcised. Don't keep the Sabbath, uh, you know, eat all the uh, shellfish, the shark and all the uh, creatures on the bottom of the sea as much as you want and eat all the pig you want. Don't read that part. You don't have to worry about that. Paul, Paul says you don't have to worry about that, which all of that stuff is for our own good. But Paul completely does away with it. And then he has the gall and temerity to say, do we make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish it. Reading Romans gets me so pissed off because it's all a lie. Straight from the pit. Straight from the pit. So now, he's going to talk about Abraham in the exact opposite way that James did. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So he's saying, oh, because he did the works, God owed him something. No, it's the least we could do. He said again, it was, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So let's see what good old James had to say about that. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? 
And the scripture was then fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness. For he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only. It was his obedience. Disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft, but uh, God desires obedience and not sacrifice. He obeyed. It was his obedience, his performance of what God had told him to do that was imputed unto him for righteousness that proved his faith. Paul is lying to you in Romans. And this is why the Romans road false gospel has tripped up so many, including that poor guy that was at the beginning of the video I showed you guys. Paul saying again, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. So that's going to make him glory for being obedient. Oh, I did what God said. I glory. Why does he have to even put it in those terms? I don't understand. But he's putting in those terms to trip you up, to get you to think, if I did what God wanted me to do, then I'm going to boast and be in glory in my boasting. Instead of just saying it was the least I could do. What else would you have me do, Father, as your servant? Why would he even project pride onto being obedient? When pride is doing things your own way, because Paul was a prideful narcissist and he's telling you to disobey God, the father, he's telling you to disobey him and to not experience the goodness of God, the father, when you do right by him and obey him, you get to have the Holy spirit and dwelling in you and you get to have his uh, presence in your life. There's nothing better than that, but he's literally teaching you that obeying God is something you're going to be proud about. This is such a double bind. It is such an inversion of the truth. This is Satan speaking through Paul. And if you can't see that, I wouldn't want to be your friend because if you believe this gaslighting, then you will gaslight other people too. If you've bought into this, you're gaslighting yourself and you're gaslighting others. And you don't know God because John said in first John, uh, that, that, how we know we know God is by keeping his commandments. That's how we know we know him. Let's go back to that real quick. I know I'm pinballing. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. John, the apostle didn't say, and hereby uh, we know that we're in pride as if we keep his commandments because then we can boast. What the heck is Paul talking about? This is the biggest lying deception of all time, of all time. It has sent more people to hell. It's worse than all dictators have done in the history of the world that have killed uh, millions of mass murders. It's worse than all of that put together. This right here, not, not John, but what Paul wrote here, Paul is, here. John is saying hereby we do know him. If we keep his commandments, we know the father. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. He's not saying you're going to be in pride if you keep the commandments because then you can boast. Everybody else in the Bible, is, except Paul and Acts, everybody else is saying if you keep the commandments, you're going to have the Holy Spirit with you. Not you're going to be able to brag and boast. And you're going to realize the Holy Spirit in you is the one empowering you because like Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And Jesus told us he's going to judge us over and over again in Revelation by our works. But we can do through Christ even Paul wrote through Christ, I can do all things, which I think is the truth. If the father asks us to do something, his commandments, as John said, are not grievous and you can do them. I am telling you, these epistles are the satanic verses of the Bible. And I'm telling you, the only truth you're going to find is through Jesus Christ and his apostles and through the Torah and the prophets. But there have been terror sown in among the wheat and it's straight from hell. Paul is speak, speaking straight from hell, teaching you to believe if you keep God's law and his commandments, you're going to become a boaster. Think about the, think about the inversion of that. That is so satanic. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So just believing that Jesus shed his blood for you and you just go on, not living even as he lived, like John told us to do. You think well, there's no measure. There's no standard by which we'll be measured. Then he starts speaking against circumcision, which I've done episodes on that. An everlasting covenant of the father. He just poo-pooed it in a single swoop. And he tried to get the even Jewish believers in Jesus to stop doing it. Acts 21. And he just took away an amazing blood covenant with the father. He took it away. 
because he hates the father and mostly he didn't want the, the Gentiles or the Goy to convert. Paul's one of the most evil men in all of history. If Paul, if, if it's true that a man named Saul of Tarsus wrote all of this and not, not that some of this might be pseudepigrapha too, meaning written by somebody else. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. For if they which are the law of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect because the law worketh wrath for where no law is, there is no transgression. Do you see what he just said? Basically said you're, you're measured by the law and the wrath of God comes on those that don't keep the law. But if you ignore it, there will be no transgression. But I remember the father saying in Hosea that my people perish for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I reject thee. So do you think if you reject God's high holy standard as given out by the Torah, the prophets and Jesus Christ himself, if you reject that and think you can just willy nilly live your life, that you're not going to be measured by your works as Jesus said over and over again in the book of Revelation. You see, he just took away the very thing that's going to help you make it. That's going to teach you how to walk with the father and keep the commandments. There's that old hymn. Oh, a closer walk with thee. To get a closer walk with thee, you do John 14, which is, if you love me, keep my commandments, I'll send you a comfort of the Holy Spirit. And by keeping the commandments, the Holy Spirit will be the Father and Son making their abode in you. Because the law worketh wrath, or where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So he's saying, if you just have faith, that's enough. Where God, the Father, said to the Gentiles that attach themselves to Israel, also reiterated in Isaiah, by the way, when he talks about the Sabbath, talks about the Gentiles attach themselves to Israel if they will honor the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, what blessings will come upon them. Check that out in the book of Isaiah. I think chapter 56, maybe, 58, one of those, somewhere in there. But it says in the Torah itself, there'll be one law for the homeborn and one for the stranger that attaches himself to Israel. There's not this willy nilly fly by the spirit thing. Yes, the Holy Spirit reminds you of all things whatsoever Jesus uh, has said and Jesus is God's word. So everything in God's word is brought back to us by the Holy Spirit, which you gotta read to get down into so you can be reminded of what he said. Not to say that the Holy Spirit can't uh, move on you uh, by the word without you having read it, but you need to read it. But this guy's saying, you don't need the law. The law, that law's gonna trip you up. And it's only this faith and belief that God is God and that Jesus is the Son of God. That's enough. that we saw earlier, James said it very well, that believing in Jesus is obeying and keeping his word and his commandments. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Yes, by receiving what Jesus did and repenting, you get peace with God. But without repentance of how you broke the law, and determining to keep it. Repentance means turning 180 from your sin, which means what is sin? Sin's measured by disobedience to God, which is the sin of witchcraft. So turning your back on sin and witchcraft and following after the Father is going to be how you receive the Holy Spirit according to John 14. So it's not by faith alone that we're justified, as James so aptly said in his letter. Now, this is where Paul starts to uh, play his little pinball game. This is the, the, the double binding that he does here and the confusion and the word salad. So now he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now there's truth in that. We should be dead, dead to sin because of what Jesus did. But what is sin now? And why do the epistles go to great lengths to get you to ignore God's law and what he already established? And then to tell you, he has lists of sins. They says you will not inherit eternal life, fornication, um, 
I'll, there's a whole list of things that he says, including fornication and, and multiple other things that somewhat coincide with what's in the law. But why does he get to redefine a law and make up a law for you that tells you what sin is, but God's law is erased. And you are made to think that you're under a curse if you keep God's law instead of under the blessing if you actually keep it. Yeah, if you break God's law, that goes for everybody. Breaking God's law, it doesn't bode well even for the ignorant. Yes, God extends some mercy to the ignorant until they know. There is, I believe, some mercy extended to them. But he said, if you rejected knowledge, I'll reject you. Ignorance is not going to justify you in the end. And he goes on, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. So what's he going to talk about? Fornication, sex out, adultery, sex outside of marriage, all those things which are in the law and we should not do. But why not just lead us back to God's word to begin with as Jesus did? Just don't understand. Not one jot or tittle will be done away with law to heaven and earth pass. And this guy's teaching you differently. He goes on, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? Why are you not under the law, but under grace? How did grace replace the law? God's grace is the ability to keep God's word through Jesus Christ, without whom we can do nothing. But through him, we can keep God's law. We can be obedient. Why would he tell uh, the woman uh, that was found in adultery to go and sin no more? Why did he tell the blind man that he healed to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing came upon him? Why would Jesus say that to people? Why would he tell people to repent? But back to Paul. You might say, well, he's saying he's telling us not to sin here, but he's Paul has pulled away the high holy standard that God the Father established. And now there is a confusion about what it really means to serve the Father. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? So he's preaching the truth there about obedience now, but he took away what obedience really means at the same time. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. How can you be a servant of righteousness and not keep the Ten Commandments? How can you not keep the Sabbath and be a servant of righteousness when God created it prior to the law even being established? How can you not get circumcised and defy that when God made that a everlasting covenant? How can you not, um, how can you eat whatever you want and not keep God's um, Levitical diet, which is for your benefit and for your health and your well-being to keep you from unclean foods? Why, why, how can you just do that and defy him? Because Paul and Acts allows you to do all of that. And how can you eat things sacrificed to idols as Paul teaches that you can in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 when Jesus in Revelation 2.14 and 2.20 rails on it? This guy makes himself a law unto his own. This is the chief narcissist. This is Satan usurping the father, trying to rise above the father and make a law of his own for which you have to keep. And by the way, his law is unkeepable. You're not going to be able to keep these laws that Paul wants you to keep without adhering to God's law because it's by keeping the commandments of the Father and the Son that you get the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. But if you don't keep their commandments, then what's going to happen when you just try to keep Paul's and Paul's alone? You'll never have the Holy Spirit to enable you to keep the commandments. And that's why you're going to continue to be in sin just as Paul admits that he continues in sin. He goes on here, Know ye not, brethren... For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. Why does he have to put it under those terms? Why does the law have to have dominion over you? Why can't the law just be what it really is? Guidelines by which you're going to be closer to the Father and pleasing unto the Father. Because that's how we please the Father is by obedience. How, how, why does this mean it has dominion over you? Why is God's law a burden when... Um, John the Apostle wrote that keeping God, God's commandments are not grievous, but Paul makes it out to be grievous. And then he goes on with some weird allegory for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as she liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So he's saying here that God the Father never died and he doesn't change. He says, I'm God, I change not. Why would he establish something and write it with his own finger 
and they decide later on to not uh, cause us to adhere to it anymore. Everlasting covenants. Why would he change on that? And how did this man, Paul, a Pharisee, get the right to upturn God's law and create his own and then use these weird allegories to try to trick you into doing it? So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. He says, wherefore, my brethren, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. This is a one of the biggest lies ever told. If we're married to the word of God using this um, allegory, this metaphor that we're the we're the bride of Christ and we're married to Jesus, he's the word of God. Why would the word of God and the law itself from which Jesus preached himself from the Torah and the prophets, why would that law that prophesied him be dead? He just made for the Gentiles the death of Jesus himself and gave you another Jesus and told you you're dead to what Jesus really is, which is God's word, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Every word that came forth from the Father is the bread of life. He's just told you that that bread is dead and that Jesus himself, the real Jesus is dead and he replaced him with another Jesus. That's what you just read. He's telling you to be married to another Jesus and that the law itself is dead now and you're married to something else. The only part of the law that's been fulfilled is the blood sacrifices, the carnal ordinances, the Levitical priesthood, because we are now the kings and priests, according to Revelation, over these temples, which is our bodies. There's no more any physical temple. There's no tent tabernacle, or, and there's no temple of Solomon anymore. We are those temples now. That's what's been done away with. Not God's word, not God's law, from which he preached himself, and Jesus preached the Ten Commandments himself. This Paul is a liar. I am not dead to Jesus, which is God's word, which the law came from. Look right here. He just told you that you're dead to the law. This is what Jesus told you about the law. Let's just look at that real quick. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. No destruction, no death to the law. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth is going to pass. Revelation 20 and 21. We just read a little bit from that. Heaven and earth passing. But while we're in this corrupted, sinful system, there is a law by which we will be measured, for which we are ignorant of and we don't keep, we will be rejected. And those of us that are calling ourselves believers in Jesus, the devils know that Jesus is the son of God. They believe it and tremble. And if you don't keep God's word, which we're going to be measured by, Jesus said over and over, we judge by our works, by keeping the commandments and by the faith of Jesus, the two together. That's the gospel. Paul is lying to you. Lying liar. If, if this guy is not in the bottom rung of hell, I don't know who is. He has lied and twisted the gospel and the evangelical church has a Romans road uh, salvation gospel that they preach that is the wide and broad road without repentance that leads to destruction. So he gaslights you by telling you let not sin reign in your mortal body, but then he tells you the law is dead. The law is perfect and upright. Read read Psalm 119 and tell me uh, all the praise that's given by the author of that um, psalm, the longest psalm, 119, and how much it talks about the goodness of the law. And then you tell me what Paul writes about it being dead is, is truth. He says, for when we are in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The sins were by the law or did the sin, the law teach us not to sin? Why is he associating your flesh being awakened by the knowledge of the law to sin? That's what it sounds like. And he's going to backtrack on that in a second because he always does that. But let's see what he says. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. 
He's calling God's high holy standard his everlasting covenant, an old letter. That's why I never call the, I call it the first Testament, not the old Testament. This man, such a liar, which, and this is where he backtracks. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Okay, that seems true. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin taking occasion by the commandment. Sin, think about that. Sin taking occasion by the commandment. It's almost like, you know how some people say the devil made me do it? He's basically saying the commandments made me do it. Because my flesh learned the commandments, it wanted to do it more. It's literally like the commandments made me do it instead of the devil made me do it. Let's read it. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Why? Why didn't you read the commandments and say like Joshua did, choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Father, the Elohim. Why, why would he, why would the first testament go to great lengths to say um, that, a, that false prophets would come along to see if you'll keep the commandments or not? And now he's telling you that the commandments are leading you to sin. He's reversing it. This is an inversion. This is Satan speaking to us through this epistle of Romans. What, they're say, what he's saying here is the exact opposite of the truth. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So because the commandment came, sin rose up in me. What is he talking about? Why did not when the commandment came, I, with my free will, my logic and reason say, God doesn't want me to do that. I'm going to determine not to do that. And that me determining not to sin and to do right by the father is pleasing because obedience is pleasing to the father. How are people reading this? And, and we're not able to see he's just twisted it all up. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. The commandment, which he's acknowledging was ordained to life, he found to be on, on, unto death. Now he's talking about himself. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and commandment, holy and just and good. So he's saying because he can't control himself and he doesn't, he refuses to abide by the truth because he lets his flesh take over that the commandment is bad. What is he talking about? This is word salad. Was then which, that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Now he's contradicting himself again. But sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal sold under sin. Okay. All right. So you're saying that all have sinned. We agree. I can agree with Paul on that. But he's saying, how could the First Testament guys like Daniel and Moses and Noah and Ezekiel and uh, all the prophets decide to do right by their own volition. How could they do right? Did they get something supernaturally better than everybody else? I trow not. They just made the choice to do right by the father. Just like Joshua said, we should do as for me and my house. We shall serve the Lord. Choose you this day who you'll serve. He's saying that he's, he finds himself choosing to do what his flesh wants it to do. He goes, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal sold under sin. Why are you sold under sin? How can pre-Jesus people choose to do right, but post-Jesus people with the Holy Spirit can't? Because this guy never had the Holy Spirit because he never taught people to keep the commandments. Jesus said those that uh, taught the law and to keep the commandments would be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't do that. He never had the real Holy Spirit. This, was a, this guy was full of demons. That's what he was. And he's saying his demons and his flesh lead him to live his life. I'm not saying that believers, even ones that have the Holy Spirit, can't from time to time of their own volition choose to be to succumb to temptation and sin. But Jesus said, go and sin no more, not ignore the law so that you won't sin anymore. Because that's what he's teaching here. He goes on, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. Why, why, Paul? Why cannot the majority of your life be spent being in obedience when God throughout the whole first Testament required that when Jesus required it or Jesus said, go and sin no more. What's wrong with you? And why are you teaching other people? Because you can't stop sinning. 
to go ahead and keep sinning? Why are you being called least by the kingdom of heaven? Because you are ignoring God's law. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Wait a second. No, man. The devil made me do it. Sin made me do it. No, man. You are responsible for yourself, brah. We are all responsible for our decisions. Now, I understand there are times where temptation overwhelms you and the titillation of it can be feel overwhelming, but you can always say in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind up every demonic spirit trying to draw me into temptation and command it to leave you and you will get back right. We have all the tools and the weapons to overcome sin, but this guy's saying that he can't. And this is the person we follow when Jesus told us to go and sin no more. He goes, for I know that is in me, that in me, that is my flesh dwelleth no good thing for the will is present with me, but how to perform that, which is good. I find now not now this somewhat coincides with something Jesus said. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's true. I agree. I agree with what he's saying here to some extent, but through Jesus, we being in power and authority over our flesh, over the devil to walk with him in purity and newness of life. Why would John say, if we don't keep the commandments, we can't know God. Why would he say that? This guy's saying, well, I'm going to be overcome by sin because I can't get control of my flesh. This is the opposite of what John the apostle taught. Opposite. Now, if I do that, I would not as no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's, that is such a cop out. That is such a cop out. You have to acknowledge when you sin that you came in agreement with sin. You chose to do it. There's no like time where we're not going to be judged by our works. And the works that we do is us giving in to sin and deciding to go with it. And we've come into agreement with Satan, his demons, his lust and his temptations, and we've decided to do what he wants. This guy could not do it because he could not have the Holy Spirit because he, could, he did not teach the commandments and he did not adhere to them. And this is supposed to be a Pharisee, someone that, would, that supposedly grew up knowing and reading the Torah. This guy acts like he never read the Torah in his life. Whoever wrote this. Saul of Tarsus or not. Otherwise, he's just writing this to get people off track and to hate God, to hate his word, to hate serving him. 